Hello everyone, today we will discuss chapter 6, cash exchange processes. This is the content of chapter 6, so we have a decent topic to be discussed in this chapter. First subtopic will be uh, the intake and exhaust processes and then volumetric efficiency. So this is the parameter to be used to quantify the performance of an intake system. And then valve and port geometry flow rates and discharge coefficients, variable valve timing and control. So this is new technology in the intake uh, system. And then scavenging in two stroke cycle engines. And the last topic will be the discussion of turbocharger. Gas exchange processes in a four stroke engine, this means the intake and exhaust processes. And in two stroke engine, this is scavenging process. The purpose of this gas exchange processes is to remove the burn gas at the end of the power stroke. And the second one is to admit the fresh charge for the next cycle. These two purposes are connected. So if we can remove more burn gas, then we can admit more fresh charge for the next cycle. And in chapter two, I think we know that the brake power of an internal combustion engine at a given speed is proportional to the mass flow rate of air into the cylinders. Equation 2.45, this one. So for the same engine size, if we can increase MA, okay, if we can increase MA, we will get an increase on the engine power. This is PP, so this is brake power. Okay, so this is the idea why we have a supercharger or two port charger in the engine. Okay, so the parameter for characterizing gas exchange processes is volumetric efficiency for four stroke engines. And second one is scavenging and trapping efficiency for two stroke engines. So we will discuss these two parameters along with the parameter influencing the volumetric efficiency and scavenging efficiency as well as trapping efficiency in this chapter. The ability of the total engine system to flow as much air as possible into each cylinder is a very important design objective. This makes sense. For a certain engine size, if you can admit more air, it means you can operate the engine under higher PMEP and thus under higher engine power for the same engine size. Okay. And then the degree to which the burn gases from the previous cycle are expelled from the cylinder also affects the airflow into the cylinder. It makes sense. So if you remove more burn gas, it means you have more space for the fresh air for, for the fresh gas into the cylinder. What's mean for the same volume, you have less density, you will have less pressure, so that the pressure different between the intake system and the cylinder is higher so that you have more or you have higher driver for the fresh gas entering the cylinder. Okay, so therefore the exhaust process is important too. And then we'll have a valve. Okay, we'll have a valve and the first valve is called throttle a valve or throttle plate. So this will control the airflow so this is upstream of the intake manifold we also have another valve this is the intake valve okay so this is right between the port and the cylinder so these two valves will control the uh, airflow entering the cylinder the maximum airflow at any given speed occurs at wide open throttle or at full load so at full load condition, so the throttle valve is widely open, so it's 100% open, okay, so that you will have maximum air entering the cylinder. This will generate maximum power of the corresponding engine. 
Now let's take a look on the intake and exhaust processes in the four-stroke cycle engine. This feature is showing the schematic of the intake and exhaust system for a spark ignition engine. So if you look at on the top right feature, so this is the intake system. Okay, so this is the intake system. And then this is the exhaust system. Okay. The intake system typically consists of an air filter and then an air duct, a throttle intake manifold, and individual cylinder fuel injector in each intake port or cylinder head. So let's take a look on this uh, schematic. So we have kind of air filter or kind of a plenum on this part. Okay. So the fresh air entering the engine at a given condition. So this is at a P0 T0 here. Okay. So assuming this is atmospheric condition, so atmospheric pressure and environment temperature. And this one is the air duct. So this is the duct connecting, let's say, this air filter with this plenum. And we have a throttle valve here. So this throttle valve control the airflow. So it will have a wide open during the full load condition or a part uh, partly open during the part load condition. And then uh, the fresh air will flow through this uh, air duct and then through the throttle valve and then this one a plenum and this one usually we call this intake runner and you can see in here we have a fuel injector at this side so it's mean this is a kind of port fuel injection so pfi and then this is the intake valve and then it's and then it's enter the chamber here and we have this piston Okay, and this is TDC, uh, BTC, so the piston doing a kind of a reciprocating movement going uh, to the right and to the right and to the left. Okay, and then on the exhaust, we have the exhaust valve, and this can be a kind of after treatment system, so this one. Okay, and this one usually we call this exhaust runner. And then this is exhaust duct. And then this one might be called kind of a silencer. So to reduce the noise. And then it will exit the engine at this point. So this is atmospheric condition. So uh, there is significant pressure drop uh, across the intake port and valve for each uh, system here but other part does have a pressure drop as well so we have a pressure drop through the air filter and then air duct a throttle for sure and then plenum and then intake runner and so on so this chart this one is showing kind of a qualitative uh, pressure history from the entrance of the engine so with a pressure of a p0 okay and then through the system upstream of the throttle so we have a pressure drop with the amount of this one delta p air okay and then this is the pressure drop through uh, delta P A, so this is the pressure drop. Let me check. So delta P air is the pressure loss at the air cleaner or air filter. And then delta P U, oh, this is delta P U. So this is the pressure drop through the system upstream of the throttle. Okay. And then this one, 
I think this one is with the sign of THR. It's not so clear here. Let me check to the book. Okay, yes, this is delta P THR. So this is the pressure drop through the throttle valve. Okay, and then we have the delta P valve. Okay, delta P valve, this one. So this is the pressure drop through the valve. Okay, and this is the total pressure drop through the intake system. So from the initial pressure of P0, okay, we have a pressure entering the cylinder, okay, entering the cylinder to be kind of uh, P here, okay. Okay, so there's a decent uh, pressure drop through each component of the intake system. And then on the feature at the top right, so you can see the schematic of the valve timing. Okay, so the exhaust valve open at point one. So this one, it's point, uh, point one. And then, so I need to inform you that this point one is about 50 degree, 60 degree before top dead center firing. So in this schematic, the crank rotation is counterclockwise, okay, counterclockwise. So it's mean it is showing by this angle. So from this point, from TDC up to point number one, where we have a EVO, so we have an expansion stroke and then the exhaust valve open at point one. So this is about 50, 60 degree before bottom dead center. So this one, and then it's doing an exhaust stroke until point number two. Okay, point number two is shown here, point number two. So from point number one to point number two, this is exhaust stroke. And you can see in this schematic that the intake valve open, so it is at point three. So this is several degree before top center firing. So you can see in this feature that there will be a valve overlap and the duration is between point two and point three. Okay, there will be a valve overlap there. So it's mean both valve are open. Okay, we will also discuss about this valve overlap what is the advantage and disadvantage of having this valve overlap and then the intake uh, stroke process will end at point four so and this is about 20 30 degree after bottom center so this is point four okay so we'll also learn the benefit of having Lead intake valve closing. Why it is not exactly at bottom dead center? Why we have lead intake valve closing? So we will discuss it in the next subtopic. Okay, so uh, the drop in pressure along the intake system uh, depend on the engine speed. So I think you know it from the fluid mechanic that the delta P. Let me write down here. The delta P. I think is a function of square of velocity and this one you might have c i think so this is the kind of a friction coefficient and i think you might have also density here and this square phi this is the flow of the air or the flow of the fresh mixture and this is controlled by the engine speed so or the piston speed we'll also discuss this in more detail in the next subtopic and then the last feature here, what you can see is the valve lift profile. So it is at the bottom right here. So the first chart here is showing the profile of the exhaust valve. So it's open somewhere here. So this is point number one. Okay, and then it's reached a maximum lift at this timing. And then the exhaust process and at point two so this is one so this is point two okay 
And then the intake uh, process uh, uh, begins at point three. So this is point three. Therefore, between point two and point three, once again, this is the period of the fast overlap. And then the intake uh, process uh, ends at point four with this here. So this is point four. Okay. And we also have the profile of the cylinder pressure here. So this is the cylinder pressure profile. And then uh, from point three to, okay, this is, uh, okay, point three here is where the intake valves uh, start to open. And then from point two, to top dead center, we still see a small increase of the cylinder pressure. So this is still part of the blow down process. And then after the piston hit the TDC, it will move back toward BDC. There will be an increase of the volume and the pressure will drop significantly. Okay, And especially because the intake valve already open, so there will be a fresh air entering the cylinder and then the pressure between the cylinder chamber and the intake system will equalize. Therefore, you can see in here, this is the reduction of the cylinder pressure. Okay. And then it will end at 0.4, which is the end of the intake stroke. This is the schematic of the intake and exhaust system for a diesel engine. In a diesel engine intake system, the port fuel injection system and the throttle plates are absent. So you don't see in this schematic. And diesel engines are more frequently turbocharged, which means it is equipped by a turbocharger. So we'll discuss this turbocharger in more detail later. So the turbocharger here is represented by a compressor C here and a turbine. And the compressor is connected to the turbine through this shaft. Okay. The fresh mixture entering the engine through this point, let's say this is point zero. So the condition is at P0 and T0. So you can assume this is atmospheric condition. And then through the compressor, this uh, mixture is compressed to higher pressure and temperature. Let's say here is P1 and T1. And then it will flow through this intake runner and then intake port and valve and finally entering the cylinder chamber. Then it's doing compression, uh, combustion and expansion process. And finally, it is expelled through this exhaust valve and exhaust port and then flow through the exhaust runner. And this is a kind of a plenum or might be a silencer to reduce the noise. And then it uh, go to the turbine. Okay, go to the turbine and the turbine will do an expansion process, there will be reduction of the exhaust gas pressure. So from PETE to be maybe here kind of uh, close to atmospheric condition. So there will be an energy extracted inside this turbine that will be used to drive the compressor. So this is the idea of having a turbo charger. And then this one is showing the schematic of the valve uh, event okay so along with the pressure profile the exhaust uh, process uh, begins at point one okay so at point one let's check it so we have intake and then we have exhaust okay it begins at point one here so this is the beginning of the exhaust process and it will end at point two so here and then once again between point two and point three we have a valve overlap okay and then the cylinder pressure will start from point one and then there will be a blow down process until uh, btc so the cylinder pressure drops significantly and then 
the exhaust stroke process end at point two. Okay. And then from point two to point four, there will be an intake stroke process. So if you compare this uh, pressure profile with the one in the previous slide, the main difference here is that the pressure during the intake stroke is higher than the pressure during the exhaust stroke. So you can see in here that the pressure level at point two is higher than the pressure level at point three. So it's mean during this gas exchange process, the engine will do a clockwise uh, thermodynamic uh, process. So it's mean this will be a positive work. Okay, so this is the idea of having a two-port charger in the engine. So you will have additional power generated by the engine. This is the reason why the engine equipped with turbo charger produces higher engine power. This feature is showing an example of uh, intake system for a gasoline spark ignition engine. So the engine size here is 3.5 liter V6. So it's mean it has the shape a kind of V. So you can see in here I draw with the purple line. So this one and then uh, there are three cylinder on each side so therefore we have uh, six a uh, cylinder I think this engine is belong to Chrysler I think you can check it in the textbook okay so uh, we have a throttle valve so this kind of throttle valve so we have two throttle valve it is mechanically connected through this uh, rod and then the fresh air entering the engine from this side okay and this one is a big plenum so it has a larger flow area than the intake uh, runner and the purpose of having this larger cross area inside the plenum is to minimize the impact of the flow on the individual uh, intake manifold okay and then what can we see here uh they have a uh, two side on each bank and then this two plenum is connected through this one through this part okay so at some point they are connected at other operating point uh they are isolated okay so so this isolation uh, occurs usually at uh, low and high speed. Okay. This feature is showing the cutway of the 2.3 liter EcoBoost Ford Mustang. So if you look at this feature, so this is the intake system. Okay. And then they saw a several new technology applied to this 2.3 liter engine. So for example, they have a high performance valve seat material. So we will look at this valve seat in the next topics. And then they also mentioned they have a high flow cylinder head with integrated exhaust uh, manifold. And then the piston, they have a light uh, weight, high strength piston. So if we have a lightweight piston, so we will have less friction work and thus more brake power. And this is another technology that is applied to this 2.3 liter EcoBoost engine. I think you can uh, use a uh, Google to find out more information about this through a 2.3 liter EcoBoost engine. Same thing, you can also look at the new uh, engine uh, by uh, GM, Chrysler, and other OEM. Next one is the exhaust system. This uh, feature is showing the component of the exhaust system and it has six cylinder i think you can see from the number of hole here so it has six holes here it's mean it is from a six cylinder engine and uh, looks like this is inline so six cylinder inline uh, this is the exhaust system for a spark ignition engine 
the exhaust system uh, typically consists of an exhaust manifold so it is shown here exhaust manifold okay this part and then a catalytic converter okay this one so it is close coupled to the engine and the purpose of having this close couple is to have a rapid light off which remove the pollutant of NOx, CO, and ammonium hydrocarbon. So it's mean this kind of three-way catalyst. So we will learn it in chapter 12 or chapter 13 about the engine emission. So light off. So this parameter is coming from the fact that a catalyst will need a time to be effective to remove the pollutant so it's mean we need to heat up this catalyst and the period of this catalyst heating is called light off period so if we can have a rapid light off so it's mean we can reduce the period of this heating so that we can uh, reduce the amount of the pollutant and the next component is a kind of muffler and then intermediate pipe and then we have uh, another muffler so and then another muffler again so this muffler acts a kind of noise damping so a silencer and then at the end we have a tailpipe here okay. so uh, similar to the intake system each of this component will uh, generate a pressure drop therefore we will have some penalty of the pressure drop through this exhaust system so this is a kind of loss so for example if you have a p4 here so in this case we have p0 so p4 will be higher than p0 and the difference here is due to the pressure drop on each uh, part of the exhaust system next topic is volumetric efficiency the volumetric efficiency is used as an overall measure of the effectiveness of an intake system of four stroke cycle engine so this only for four stroke cycle engine we have a different parameter to measure the effectiveness of an intake system for two stroke engine so uh, i think i have introduced this parameter in chapter two so you can review it this volumetric efficiency is defined as the volume flow rate of air into the intake system at defined air condition so we will discuss this later divided by the rate at which volume is displaced by the piston it is formulated by this formula so m dot a here is the air mass flow rate and then rho here is the density and then vd is the swap volume or the displacement and then n capital here is the engine rotation speed the air density rho here is usually evaluated at atmospheric condition so this is at the entrance of the engine if it is the case then this volumetric efficiency is the overall volumetric efficiency which means this is the volumetric efficiency of the whole intake system so it includes the air filter and then air uh, a throttle valve and then plenum and then intake runner intake port and the intake valve the density can be evaluated at inlet inlet manifold condition so this means we have rho a comma i if it is the case then this volumetric efficiency measure the pumping performance of the cylinder intake port and valve alone okay so it doesn't include the performance of the air filter the performance of the air duct the performance of the throttle and so on so so this is also possible to define the volumetric efficiency with the density evaluated at inlet manifold condition so looking at this formula uh, there will be a several phenomena or factors have 
having a significant effect on this volumetric efficiency. So we'll take a look one by one of this factor. And this is very important, uh, especially if we want to maximize this volumetric efficiency so that we can check each parameter, which one that can be improved to have a higher volumetric efficiency. Typical maximum volumetric efficiency is about 90%. Now let's take a look on each parameter having a significant impact on the volumetric efficiency. The first parameter we discuss here what is called quasi-static effects. This include the effect of the fuel composition and then a fuel air ratio, fuel vaporation, and then intake air temperature ratio of exhaust to manifold pressure so this is pe over pi and then compression ratio and so on so the way we want to see the impact of each parameter in this uh, quasi static effect is by uh, manipulating or modifying the formula of the volumetric efficiency so you can see in here we have equation 6.1 so this is the original formula of the volumetric efficiency. So in this case, we formulate as the ratio of the air mass to the mass uh, displaced by the piston. So MA is the air mass and then rho A, comma zero here is the air density at the entrance of the engine. And then VD is the displacement. And then uh, we substitute MA and VD here by including uh, RC as the compression ratio and then uh, XR. I think I introduced this parameter in chapter 4. So this is the uh, burn gas fraction. And then F2A here is the fuel air ratio. And then V1 is the cylinder volume at the end of the intake stroke or at the beginning of the compression stroke. So you can see the PV diagram on the bottom right side here, point one is here. So this is the end of the intake stroke. Uh, we can modify equation 6.1 to get 6.2. And you can see now that the volumetric efficiency is a function of the ratio of the molecular weight of the trap mass, so just M here and then M Capital A here is the molecular weight of air. It is also a function of this pressure ratio, Pi, okay, over Pa, comma zero, and then this is also a function of uh, T uh, temperature ratio, okay. So I here is the value at the intake system, okay, inside the intake manifold, and then. Uh, we have RC and then gamma, here is the specific heat ratio. And this one is the ratio of the exhaust to the manifold pressure. So you can see that the exhaust pressure has the impact on the volumetric efficiency. Okay, uh, you can pay attention on this second uh, part which is uh, bracketed by this one. So this value will equal to 1 if uh, PE over PI equal to 1. Okay, so using this formula, we will look at the impact of individual parameter which is uh, classified as the quasi-static effect. Let's take a look at the impact of the fuel composition phase and a fuel air ratio. Uh, the presence of a gaseous fuel and water vapor in the intake system uh, reduces the air partial pressure below the mixture pressure. It makes sense. In Thermo 2, we learn about the wet air, dry air. So wet air, so it means we have dry air plus a water vapor and the total uh, pressure or the mixture pressure is the sum of the dry air partial pressure plus the uh, water vapor partial pressure. So, and then if we have a gaseous fuel, then the mixture pressure will be also uh, the sum of these two plus the 
gaseous uh, field partial pressure. So this is this equation. So PI here is the total pressure in the intake system. So this contribution from the air, uh, dry air, this is from the fuel, this is from the water vapor. And then uh, you saw it from the previous uh, slide, equation 6.2, that the volumetric efficiency is a function of a PI over uh, PA. So take a look again on the previous slide that the volumetric efficiency here is a function of uh, PI over PA. And you can formulate uh, PA over PI by using this equation 6.3. So you can see in here that for certain amount of, of fuel and certain amount of air, it will have an impact to this pressure ratio and finally to the volumetric uh, efficiency. So this is for the mixture one skin mixture of air water vapor and gaseous or evaporated fuel okay and then uh, we will see i think in the next slide that uh, there is also an impact of the fuel type okay on the volumetric efficiency through this molecular weight uh, ratio okay for conventional liquid fuel such as a gasoline which have a higher molecular weight the effect of fuel vapor and therefore fuel air ratio is relatively small but for gaseous fuel and for ethanol methanol vapor the volumetric efficiency is significantly reduced by the fuel vapor in the mixture so I copied again equation 6.3 on the top right. So once again, the PA over PI here is a function of this uh, molecular weight ratio. Okay, so a gasoline has a higher uh, molecular weight, therefore it has a minor impact to the volumetric efficiency. But like methanol, ethanol, it has a lower molecular weight so that it has significant impact to the volumetric efficiency and this feature is showing the dependency of this pressure ratio to the equivalent ratio of a, a different fuel so we have a ch818 this is usually used as a surrogate for gasoline and then if you have hydrogen so hydrogen here you can see the V has a significant impact to this uh, pressure ratio and this one is methanol and this one ethanol this is a methane so now you can see another uh, impact of having E10 or E15 okay on your car compared to just having E0 I think we talk about this one a bit so in I think in almost all a uh, fuel station in the state it contain about 10 to 15 percent ethanol okay so a good thing of ethanol is it has a, a good emission and then it's also improved the engine pte i think but from the volumetric efficiency perspective so we'll have some penalty on the volumetric efficiency of the engine by having certain amount of ethanol to the gasoline Next one is looking at the impact of the fraction fuel vaporize and heat of vaporization. So in this case, we will apply an energy balance okay, on the steady flow. So this energy balance is applied uh, between the condition before and after the fuel evaporation. It is represented by equation 6.4. Okay, so on the left side is showing the term for after evaporation condition so here we have the energy from air and this one is part of the energy from the fuel and this one is uh, for liquid size and this one is for the vapor size and then 
on the right side is the term of the energy before the evaporation. I need to mention to you that there is a typo in the second version of the book so that you can see in here there is a empty space here so it's mean this is the typo in the second version of the book so because they have m dot a time h a plus m dot a again time h a so this is a typo so you need to to check it and correct it yourself okay uh, second typo is in this one so this one is must be replaced by 1 minus x f e okay so not not x x e only okay okay by applying an energy balance to the condition before and after field evaporation you will get equation 6.5 this showing the temperature difference uh, between before and after the fuel evaporation and this parameter represent the charge uh, cooling okay if it is air then it's called charge air cooling so this ta over tb uh, depend on the heat of evaporation of the corresponding fuel for example if you have isooctane and it is under stoichiometric condition the temperature difference here is minus 20 degree but if we use ethanol or methanol the temperature difference here will be minus 73 and minus 122 what is the consequence here is that we will have a colder mixture inside the engine so if it is a kind of a gdi then it will have a good impact on the volumetric efficiency because the cooler temperature the higher density so from this perspective having ethanol into the gasoline give a benefit for the volumetric efficiency so but from the first slide uh, by looking at different parameter looking at the ratio of the molecular weight we have a negative impact of having ethanol to the volumetric efficiency okay and then uh, I already introduced you uh, a different fuel introduction to the engine so we have PFI so it's mean we inject the fuel upstream of the intake valve uh, for this case uh, usually the injected fuel hit the back side of the intake valve or some part of the intake port so it's mean the vaporization heat is mainly coming from the wall okay and then for GDI which is uh, injected directly inside the cylinder so the evaporation heat of the fuel is mainly coming from the air because most of the fuel will flow along with the high inflow rate of the air so in this case GDI will have more cooling effect to the uh, fresh uh, charge make sure then the one for the PFI next one is looking at the effect of intake and exhaust pressure ratio and compression ratio so as the pressure ratio so in this case PE over PI so it's exhaust to intake uh, pressure ratio as the pressure ratio and the compression ratio are varied the fraction of the cylinder volume occupied by the residual gas at the intake pressure varies as well so as I mentioned to you if we can remove more uh, burn gas or residual gas then we also have more space for the fresh gas entering the cylinder we will still use equation 6.2 I saw it on the top uh, right here to see the impact of this pressure ratio and compression ratio so this feature is showing the impact of this pressure ratio and compression ratio to the volumetric efficiency so the volumetric efficiency value here is represented as the ratio of the new volumetric efficiency to the baseline so baseline one it is the denominator here so as we uh, increase uh, the PE over PI we will get a lower volumetric efficiency it makes sense okay because you have higher exhaust pressure 
which means you will have higher residual from the previous cycle going into the next cycle. And then if you maintain at the same uh, pressure ratio, so if it is uh, below one, then having a higher compression ratio will uh, lower the volumetric efficiency. On the contrary, if this uh, pressure ratio is above one, then by having a higher compression ratio, it will improve the volumetric efficiency. Next one is looking at the intake and exhaust flow resistance. When gas flows unsteadily through a system of pipes, chambers, ports, and valve, friction pressure and inertial forces are present. And the relative importance of these forces depends on gas velocity and the size of shape of uh, these passages and their junction. I think in fluid mechanic, you have been introduced this uh, formula. So we have a uh, delta P, so pressure drop, here is a function of uh, kind of uh, friction factor, uh, C, and then uh, density, and then uh, velocity. Okay, you can check it. So we have a uh, parameter here. Once again, this one is C is uh, flow resistance coefficient, I think, and this one is the density, and this one is the velocity. So velocity has a direct impact, so it is square, and then gas density, and the first one here, this uh, parameter depends on the size and shape of the passages, uh, like along whether you have elbow, junction, and so on. So this will impact this uh, flow uh, resistance coefficient. And then uh, there are also several uh, phenomena which affect the volumetric uh, efficiency and we'll look at it later. And then during the intake stroke, so to do this uh, flow induced friction in each part of the intake system, because we have uh, air filter, ducting, throttle, manifold, intake pot, intake valve, because of the pressure drop uh, through each of this component, then the cylinder pressure, PC, is less than the intake pressure. It makes sense. So, for example, if we have a PI equal to P0, for example, this is the atmospheric pressure. So, the cylinder pressure will be lower than P0. Okay, And then uh, the pressure in the cylinder during the period of the intake process when the piston is moving at high speed, uh, high speed it means high uh, engine rotation speed, it can be up to 20% lower than PI. Okay. And this is mainly coming from this uh, pressure drop. This is the mathematical analysis of this pressure drop. So we use this formula to calculate the pressure drop. I think it is the same as what I wrote in the previous slide. So we have a flow resistance coefficient here, and then this is the density, and the last one is the flow velocity. And then assuming the flow is quasi steady, since the piston motion uh, pull the intake of flow, so then a Vj is uh, related to the piston speed, Sp, okay? So in this case, we have a Vj time Aj. So this is Aj here is the uh, cross-sectional area of the corresponding intake system component equals to Sp time Ap. So Ap here is the piston area. Okay. Then the total quasi-steady average pressure loss due to friction is estimated by equation 6.6. .6. Okay. You can see in here, uh, this is the initial pressure, either this is at atmospheric pressure or this is manifold pressure, minus Pc, so this is the pressure inside the cylinder, equals to the sum of the pressure drop uh, in each uh, intake system component. So you have this formula, okay? equation 6.6. .6. This feature is showing the pressure losses in the intake system of a four-stroke uh, spark ignition engine determined from under steady flow condition. 
So there are two pressure drop here. So the first one is P atmosphere minus PR. The second one is uh, P atmosphere minus PP. And you can see the schematic of the intake system on this uh, feature. So this is a function of the mass flow rate, so M dot here. And the engine size, I think stroke equal to 89, 89 uh, millimeter. And then bore equal to 84 millimeter. From this information, from this information, you can convert this uh, mass flow into the engine speed here. So the second horizontal axis here. So uh, the first one is looking at the pressure drop uh, between the atmospheric pressure and PR. Okay, PR here is the pressure drop at this manifold okay at this manifold so it's mean this consider the pressure drop inside this uh, ducting and then cleaner and then another ducting here and then a throttle plate here and also uh, inside this intake manifold and the second one here is p atmosphere minus pp so it doesn't include the pressure drop inside this uh, manifold so therefore it is lower and you can see in here that the pressure loss here depend on the speed square so you can see from this line next one is intake port and valves so the engine intake port and valve constitute a comparable flow resistance than that of the intake system. So usually the pressure drop through this intake port and valve is the highest pressure drop compared to the other component. So the relative size of the valve head and seat and thus their open area are constrained by the size of the cylinder liner. And the next one is the exhaust system port and valves. Equivalent flow dependent pressure losses in the exhaust system result in the exhaust port and manifolds having average pressure level that are higher than atmospheric uh, pressure. So this makes sense once again because of the pressure losses, then we have a higher pressure inside the exhaust manifold than the one in the atmospheric environment. So this feature is showing the exhaust manifold pressure as a function of load. So the load here is represented by the level of the inlet manifold pressure. So the higher inlet manifold pressure is, the higher the load is. As you remember, if we have higher inlet manifold pressure, we have higher mass flow and thus higher engine output power. So. Uh, as you can see in here, if uh, we have a higher load, then we will have a higher exhaust manifold pressure. And another parameter shown here is a different engine speed. Okay, So for each uh, engine speed here, once again, if we have higher load, then we will have a higher exhaust manifold pressure. And this one is a gauge pressure, I think. Okay, This is a gauge pressure relative to the atmospheric pressure so it means if you want to get the total pressure so it must be uh, this value for example plus the atmospheric uh, pressure which is one atmosphere and then the flow resistance of the exhaust valves and ports are less significant than on the intake sides because of these two reasons so the first reason is because substantial fraction of the in-cylinder burn gas is exhausted between the exhaust valve opening and about bottom center in the blowdown process. So most of the exhaust gas exceed the cylinder during this uh, blowdown process. And this process is controlled mainly by the pressure difference between the cylinder and the exhaust system or exhaust manifold. And the second reason is the exhaust gas is hot so it means its density is lower and therefore uh, it has a lower impact on the pressure drop and if you remember the pressure drop 
depends on the flow resistance coefficient and then density and the speed square so in the exhaust system it has a much lower density so it can be by a factor of three to four therefore it will have a less pressure drop than the one for the intake system next one is looking at the impact of the intake and in cylinder heat transfer so as air flow through each port with its wall close to the coolant temperature which is about 90 degrees c and pass the hot intake valve surface and so intake valve surface usually is hot because it has a less cooling so temperature can be around 150 degrees c some heating of the intake air occurs so when we have a heating on the fresh air or fresh mixture then it is not good for the volumetric efficiency because the temperature is high and then the density is lower and the next one there will be also the impact of the in cylinder heat transfer so as the air flow into the cylinder it mixed with the hot uh, burn gas residual left in the cylinder from the previous cycle so although it has conducted a kind of a several process so blow down and then exhaust stroke the burn gas that go to the next cycle is still hot okay so it will give some uh, heating to the fresh mixture that just enter the cylinder and then the next one is the temperature of the piston valves and cylinder head are higher than this mixture temperature so heat transfer to the in cylinder unburned mixture occurs so this is another heat transfer so all of this has a bad effect to the volumetric efficiency next parameter is intake valve timing effects the mass of air inducted into the cylinder each cycle and hence the volumetric efficiency is also determined by the total pressure level in the intake port during the later portion of the intake process and at higher engine speed the inertia of the gas in the intake system as the intake valve is closing increases the pressure in the intake port and this continue the cylinder charging process as the piston slow down as it's approach uh, BDC and start the compression stroke and once again this effect become progressively greater as the engine speed increases so this is the reason why the intake valve in fixed valve timing engine is close some like 50 to 60 degree after bottom dead center to take the advantage of this uh, phenomena which is called ram phenomenon and then because the intake valve closes after the start of the compression a reverse flow of already inducted fresh charge from the cylinder into the intake can occur as the cylinder pressure rises due to the piston motion toward tdc and this reverse flow is higher at the low engine speed so you can see there there will be an optimization of this intake valve closing between getting the benefit of the ram phenomenon and reducing the penalty of this reverse flow at the low engine speed so it is an evitable low speed consequence of the intake valve closing time chosen to take advantage of the ram effect at high engine speed so we will have a substantial loss of air from the cylinder which is about 15 percent at 1500 rpm and then with earlier ifc at this condition the loss is significantly reduced so this is the case for the fixed valve timing and in the new engine technology they already apply variable valve timing this feature is showing the effect of intake valve closing angle on a gasoline spark ignition engine torque so this is normalized versus engine speed so the vertical axis here is the normalized uh, torque and then 
the horizontal axis here is the engine speed and then this one showing a different intake valve closing timing so as you can see in here as we retard the intake valve closing you will see the benefit of the torque at higher engine speed so it's going down here so it's mean we retard the intake valve closing so we'll have a better torque at a high engine speed but there is a penalty okay there is a penalty of this engine power at lower engine speed and the failure in the middle so somewhere here is uh, a kind of compromising timing for the intake valve closing so we still have a decent torque at low engine speed while still maintaining a decent uh, power or decent torque at high engine speed next topic is airflow choking at intake valve so because of this choking uh, the engine speed is limited as the intake valve opens its minimum flow area so at the beginning the minimum flow area will be uh, the annular rings between the valve head and the valve seat so its minimum flow area increases from zero up to about half the maximum valve lift then the minimum uh, flow area is controlled by the port area so this minimum flow area become the flow restricting area and the airflow in this uh, minimum flow area in the intake valve and port system is pulled into the cylinder by the downward piston motion so that we can have a correlation between the piston speed to the velocity at uh, that minimum area so by using this correlation so on the right side this is sp the piston speed and then ap is the piston area and then this one is the area of the restricting area and this one is the speed at that restricting area so assuming we have a uh, engine with the bore equal to stroke equal to 85 and then let's say we have the valve diameter so this one we uh, assume we have two intake valves so with the valve diameter of 36 and then we have valve width of 10 millimeter and then let's say the piston speed is 20 meter per second so this gives an airflow velocity past the valve seat of 300 meter per second at the valve lift of 2 to 3 millimeter at the engine speed of 7000 rpm so this 2 to 3 millimeters is attained at about 45 degree after the intake valve opening and uh, at this condition we can estimate the speed of sound for air is about 330 meter per second so it's mean at this condition so the flow of the air at this restricting area is close to the speed of sound so it's mean the flow is close to the sonic flow so when the flow is a sonic flow so it's mean the flow is choke so it's mean it uh, will uh, decrease uh, the pressure downstream of this flow restriction this is the mathematical analysis of the airflow choking at intake valve i think in the fluid mechanic class you have been introduced to the flow through the nozzle diffuser and this is the formula of the mass flow through the nozzle or diffuser but in this case this is the mass flow through the restricting area in the intake system so it is controlled by the pressure different between uh, downstream and upstream uh, as well as the discharge coefficient so this depends on the shape of the flow passage and then temperature and specific heat ratio 
and this equation C.8 is for the case if the flow is under sonic flow. When the flow is choked, the equation changes to equation C.9. So in this case, the mass flow rate is only controlled by the upstream pressure. So it is independent of the downstream pressure. So what does this mean here? So any further decrease of the downstream pressure by increasing the engine speed won't change the mass flow rate into the engine. So this onset of the airflow choking effectively defines the upper speed limit of the engine since engine brake power now start to decline. Okay, so once again, this airflow choking limits the upper limit of the engine speed. So if you want to get more detailed derivation of this equation, you can go to Appendix C at the end of the reference book.